Deuteronomy chapter 19. Listen, before we jump into the word, I just want to take this opportunity to uh, say to you, thank you for your love for God's word. Uh, listen, I know how it is on Thursday nights, especially this time of the year when it starts getting darker earlier, and you get home and you want to stay home and you're tired and beat up and what brings you here is your love for and hunger for the Word of God. And I just want to say to you, uh, not only thank you, but you make teaching God's Word such a joy and such a privilege that I so look forward to Thursday nights. They're sort of the highlight of the week for me. And I have to confess, there are times where, you know, I, you know, on a Thursday, because I'm studying all day, and I, I get home, and I've been studying from morning until it's time to come here. And I'll go home usually and have a little bite to eat and, and shower. I do shower and uh, <laughs> change <laughs> and get ready to come here. And there are just times where I just think, oh, I am so tired. And then it just hits me. Wait a minute. <laughs> I can't wait. And isn't it true? I know this is how it is for me, and I can't imagine that you're much different than me. I know, thankfully, you look different than me, but you're not a lot different than me in that when you leave, even though you're tired and you get here, once you get here, oh, you're so glad you got here. You're so, because there's, without exception, always something that God has specifically for you, that word fitly spoken from his word. And so I just wanted to begin by telling you thank you for your love for God's word. Let's pray. Ask God's blessing on our time. Loving Father in heaven, thank you so much. Thank you for your grace, your mercy, your kindness, your goodness, your love for us. Lord, as we now open up our Bibles and seek to study your word and learn of you, we're going to ask of you for your Holy Spirit to teach us and speak to us and minister to us. Lord, many of us are here tonight with specific needs, very real needs. And we know that whatever we have need of, your hand will provide. For those of us here tonight, Lord, that just need maybe an encouraging word, a word of hope, Lord, I just pray that you would, by the Holy Spirit, speak to us tonight and give to us tonight that encouragement and that hope in this chapter that we have before us. Lord, thank you in advance for what you're going to do in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 1. Again, we're still in... Sermon number two of five that Moses preaches. Very long sermon, which is what I love about it. I love long sermons. And so we will finish this sermon soon. Take heart. But Moses continues in verse one and says, When the Lord your God has cut off the nations whose land the Lord your God is giving you, and you dispossess them and dwell in their cities and in their houses, you shall separate three cities for yourself in the midst of your land, which the Lord your God is giving you to possess. Well, Moses here is once again addressing these cities of refuge. Now, we studied about these cities of refuge in great detail back when we were in the book of Numbers, the 35th chapter. So here we have it repeated again, and Moses is following up on this command for them to build these cities of refuge. So now he's going to deal with 
the three additional cities of refuge which they could not yet build because these were the three that would be built once they entered into the promised land. See, there was a total of six of these cities of refuge, and three of them were to be on the east side of the Jordan River, and these other three, the three that he's now going to address, are to be on the west side of the Jordan River, which would place them in the promised land. In Numbers chapter 35, verses 9 through 12, Moses is telling them of the importance in having these cities of refuge. We read that the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you cross the Jordan into the land of Canaan, speaking of the promised land, then you shall appoint cities to be cities of refuge for you that the manslayer who kills any person accidentally may flee there. They shall be cities of refuge for you from the avenger, that the manslayer may not die until he stands before the congregation in judgment. Now, for the benefit of those who were not with us in our study in the book of Numbers, I'm going to try to fill in some of the blanks related to the purpose of having these cities of refuge, really the importance of having these cities of refuge. See, it's important to understand that in those days, the law and order of the day was that you had to take the law into your own hands and avenge the murder of a family member. By the way, parenthetically, let me say that in the Middle East today, this is still practiced. In my culture, in the Arab culture, this would fall under the category, and you hear it more in the context of Islam, but this is really defending the honor of the family. The Muslims call it an honor killing. It's avenging the death or avenging or upholding the honor of the family. It carries with it sort of the same thought. So these cities of refuge were God's protection for any man who, in the case of an accidental death, isn't killed by the avenger of that death before his case was brought to trial. Charles Spurgeon of this says, the Israelites, in common with other nations, had among them the institution of blood revenge by which the nearest relative was bound to revenge a man's death. To meet the evils connected with this deep-seated custom, places were appointed to which the manslayer might flee and be secure till the time came for a fair trial. Now, here's a question. Why is it that Moses, at this juncture, is repeating, reiterating, why they need these cities of refuge. Why is he reminding them of the importance of these cities of refuge? Here's a thought. I believe that first and foremost, it's here again mentioned for what would be deemed practical reasons. See, the first three of the six cities of refuge could have already been appointed and even built because it's prior to their entrance into the promised land. Now this is going to be germane to our understanding, so please stay with me here. There's a practical reason for, for Moses bringing this up again and harping on this again as it seems that he does. And there's much of this chapter given to the preaching about the importance of these cities of refuge. There must be a reason. This is certainly not in vain. Moses isn't looking for sermon material like I do, you know, to fill in some of the... I don't, I don't do that. I know other pastors do that. I don't do that. <laughs> okay, I do that. But Moses isn't doing that. See, they could not yet appoint the other three. They could while on the east side of the Jordan, at least see to it that the first three cities of refuge 
were completed. Now, there's a huge, valuable life lesson that's woven into the fabric of what might be seen at first glance as a nebulous or even redundant detail. I mean, I think we're, if we're to be honest, we're prone to read very quickly through a passage like this, especially since we've already studied it, we've already read it. So what's the point? No, there is a point. Here's what I'm thinking. If we're unable to carry out all that God has called us to do, namely the building of all six of these cities of refuge, we can at least carry out and do what we're able to do, three of the six of these cities of refuge. Now, why do I say that? Just because we can't do everything God has told us to do doesn't mean that we can sit idly by until we can. Now, hear me out on this, because we do this. And when we do it, we do it to our own peril. We have this idea that, well, I need to wait until all my ducks are in a row. And we use that as an excuse for our laziness in being busy about the things of God. Well, I can't do all six of them, so I, I'd rather start and do all of them when I can do all of them. So because I can't do all of them, I'm not going to do any of them. Okay, well, you're saying, I understand how it's easy to do that, but I don't think I do that. Well, I wouldn't be too quick to dismiss this because not only are we prone to do this, we do this in very subtle ways. Here, here's an example, and this is just a sort of a generic example, if you will. Y you'll see this when someone is, you know, talking about, well, I'm not going to devote my time and my energies and my talents into the service of you know, God's work and furthering God's kingdom until all of my affairs are in order. I'm going to wait until financially I've got enough income so that I can you know, serve the Lord full time. This is a common one. Actually, I hear it more times than I care to you know, talk about. And by the way, not here. This is on the mainland. This is the mainland, not here. You guys are great. And, you know, so... Please don't think that it's anyone here. It's not. <laughs> Did I do okay on that one? How am I doing? All right. Here's the point, and I do have one. See, I think that we, in our laziness, are not about the business of God's work. And we excuse it under the banner of not being able to do everything so we, not, we don't follow through on anything. And that's what Moses is doing here. He is following up and he's following through on the remaining three cities of refuge for the children of Israel. Now, remember, Moses will not enter into the promised land with this next generation of Israelites. And by the way, they're only days away from entering in. I would suggest they're probably less than a month away from entering in and taking possession of the promised land. And by the way, Moses is the same number of days away from his death, and he knows it. And they know it, because God has already told them that. So it's for this reason that Moses has got to sort of tie up these loose ends and he's got to follow through and follow up in order to see to it that they do all that God has commanded them to do. A couple thoughts here. First of all, it is so important when it comes to having the integrity to follow through on all that God has commanded you to do. This is kind of the, if I can say it this way, the dirty little secret 
in a life of a Christian. You know, we're so quick to commit. But then when we start realizing, wait a minute, I didn't realize that it was going to cost so much and take so much and be so hard. And so we falter in our unwillingness to complete that which we've committed to do, that which we've been commanded to do. Now, back in Deuteronomy chapter 4, we saw that Moses would see to it that these first three cities were built. It's found in Deuteronomy 4, verses 41 through 43. We read, then, Moses set apart three cities on this side of the Jordan toward the rising of the sun, speaking of the east, that the manslayer might flee there who kills his neighbor unintentionally without having hated him in time past, and that by fleeing to one of these cities he might live. Bezar in the wilderness on the plateau for the Reubenites, Ramath in Gilead for the Gadites, and Golan in Bashan for the Manasites. Uh, by the way, that's going to be uh, key as we get into and complete the rest of the chapter. But these were the two and a half tribes that remained on the east side of the Jordan River and would not go in, did not want to enter in to the promised land. So, since these first three were completed, it's now time for the second three to be completed once they dispossess the land of those other nations. After they dispossess the land of those other nations and possess the land as a nation, they must follow through on these three cities of refuge. Not only were they to build them, they were to be well built when they build them and well maintained so that anyone accused of a murder that was unintentional, they would have access to these cities of refuge. Now, before we move on to verse 3, I want to say this. Maybe this is for one or more here tonight. But it's the enemy who, as the avenger, will chase us to kill us when we sin. But if we flee to that city of refuge, as we'll see here shortly, he can't touch us. That's why God wanted these cities of refuge in place and accessible. They needed to be built and they needed to be available because it was a life and death matter. Someone who was accused of a crime, of murdering somebody, first degree murder, but was innocent of that crime, could flee there, find refuge there. Does that sound a little bit like the person of Jesus Christ whom we flee to? Well, it certainly is, and we'll see that momentarily. Verse 3, you shall prepare roads for yourself and divide it into three parts, the territory of your land, which the Lord your God is giving you to inherit, that any manslayer may flee there. And this is the case of the manslayer who flees there, that he may live. Whoever kills his neighbor unintentionally not having hated him in time past, as when a man goes to the woods with his neighbor to cut timber and his hand swings a stroke with the axe to cut down the tree and the head slips from the handle and strikes his neighbor so that he dies, he shall flee to one of these cities and live. I hate it when that happens. <laughs> Lest the avenger of blood, while his anger is hot, Pursue the manslayer and overtake him because the way is long and kill him, though he was not deserving of death since he had not hated the victim in time past. Therefore, I command you, saying, you shall separate three cities for yourself. If they're not there, someone could be put to death by the avenger unnecessarily, all because there was no city of refuge to flee to. That's how serious it was. That's how important it was. Now, Moses is going to provide, using these graphic details, 
<laughs> what would warrant the fleeing to one of these cities of refuge? And he uses the example of an accidental death. I mean, what a scenario. I mean, two men go out, they're going to chop wood. You know, Harry calls up Frank. I, if anybody's, you know, named Harry, I apologize in advance, but he call, hey, bro, bro, you know, <laughs> whatever. I just, I want to be, you know, fair to the, you know, the mainland word, but because they don't say bra, they say bro. So anyway, I just thought I'd mention that to you in case you didn't know. Now you do. Hey, let's go chop wood together. Hey, sounds good. I'll get the truck and the axe. The problem is the axe head is kind of loose. It's, uh, you know, not a very good axe, not a very new axe. And Moses is describing this scenario. They both go out and are chopping wood. And lo and behold, <laughs> while one of the guys is chopping with his axe, he, he, and the axe head flies off the handle which is where we get that expression, you're flying off the handle. I think that's where they, maybe not, I don't know. If not, just see me afterwards. But let's just say that that's where they get that, because I can't think of any other way you come up with something like flying off the handle. So the axe head flies off the handle. I mean, what are the odds? <laughs> and it lands on the, you know, other guy, you know, and kills him. <laughs> what in the world? And so Moses is saying, clearly, this is an accident. We call them freak accidents, don't we? Okay, it was a complete fluke. Now here we got a problem. Because it's just this man's word. Because the other guy, that's thank you. <laughs> he just isn't around anymore, so to speak. So, well, how are you going to know if this was a premeditated first-degree murder, or was it an accidental death? I mean, Mercy, can you imagine this guy, this poor guy, going back? <laughs> You're not going to believe what happened, man. We went out to chop wood, me and Harry. And I can't believe it. It's just a, it was a freak accident. My axe head flew off the handle and killed him. I can't believe it. Can you imagine hearing that story? Yeah, right. Sure. <laughs> Are you going to believe him? No, you're not. Don't look at me like that. You're not going to believe him. Because you see, in our sin nature, that man is guilty until proven innocent. Instead of the other way around. Innocent until proven guilty. That is such a farce. Well, a man's innocent until proven guilty. No, he's not. He is guilty as sin. That axe head didn't fly off the handle. He killed him. He murdered him. Kill him. Avenge the death of Harry. That's basically the scenario that Moses is presenting. Now, what's he going to do in the meantime until his innocence is proven, until he's given a fair trial where he's got to flee? to a place of refuge, a city of refuge where he will be protected and safe until such a time as they're able to give him a fair trial. Now, this brings up the question of whether or not Israel would follow through and actually build these other three, these second three of six cities of refuge once they got into the promised land. See, we make promises, right? And, but do we ever follow through and do? I mean, sometimes when we're in a jam, I, again, I know you don't do this. Other carnal Christians do this, but they'll make promises to God, vows to God. God, if you'll get me out of this, you know, situation, I promise you, I will tithe 50% if you'll just get me out of this. Get me out of this situation I'm in. And then God does it. God gets him out of the situation. And then, this is going to date me, I know, but remember, I, I rarely quote movies, by the way, but remember that really old Burt Reynolds movie when he's drowning out in the ocean and he's praying to God. See, some of you know others are going, I don't. That's okay. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Rent the DVD. They probably don't even have it on DVD. It's VHS maybe, but... <laughs> 
He's drowning. Oh, God, if you'll save me, I promise I'll, you know, go to church. And he keeps making these promises to God. If God will just somehow save him, you know, make it to shore and not drown. And the closer he gets to shore, <laughs> the less he, you know, commits to. And by the time he gets there, it's kind of like, okay, thank you. It's kind of like when Jesus healed ten men. And only one followed through and thanked him, and to which Jesus would respond and say, where are the other nine? Just a thought. Lest you become as convicted as I am right now, let's move on. Well, we see in the book of Joshua that, yes, they did. It's in Joshua chapter 20. Uh, we'll get to the book of Joshua in about two or three years. Joshua 20, verses 7 and 8. So they appointed Kadesh in Galilee... In the mountains of Naphtali, Shechem, in the mountains of Ephraim, and Kirjath Arba, which is Hebron, totally occupied by the Palestinians today. Just thought I'd mention that. In the mountains of Judah, and on the other side of the Jordan, by Jericho eastward, they assigned, again, here we have it, Bezer, in the wilderness on the plain, from the tribe of Reuben, Ramoth, in Gilead, from the tribe of Gad, and Golan, in Bashan, from the tribe, someone better tell Syria about Golan. Just uh, throw that in. From the tribe of Manasseh. Now, <laughs> this is interesting. Three of the six cities of refuge on the other side of the Jordan were for only two and a half of the tribes. Remember? Two and a half of the tribes said, hey, we don't want to enter in. Let us just have this land. It's good for our livestock. And Moses acquiesces on the condition that the men will go with them into the promised land, fight the battles, then they can return to their families and their livestock. And they agree. So we have two and a half tribes with three cities. And if there's only six cities of refuge, that means that the other nine and a half tribes, do the math, also only had, amongst all of them, the same number of cities. That's disproportionate. Why? Why would that be? Well, the verses that will follow will answer this for us. But for now, suffice it to say, though they were unequally distri distributed, th two and a half tribes, three cities, nine and a half tribes, three cities, they were still only a one-day travel away. Adam Clark, in his commentary, says, The cities of refuge were distributed through the land at proper distances from each other that they might be convenient to every part of the land. And it is said they were situated on eminences that they might be easily seen at a distance, the roads leading to them being broad, even and always kept in good repair against Spurgeon. And this is going to be uh, important to our understanding. He said, these were chosen on each side of the river that a refuge might be accessible to every man. Ah, in other words, of the nine and a half tribes in the promised land, they still had access to the three cities that were on the east side of the Jordan. So in other words, it wasn't exclusively for just two and a half tribes, nor were the other three cities only for the nine and a half tribes. Spurgeon goes on to say, even so is Jesus a Savior freely presented to all who desire him. The roads were repaired and handposts set up to direct fugitives, of which, by the way, we all are. We're all sinners, and thus the gospel is made plain so that he who runs may read. Verse 8, now, if the Lord your God enlarges your territory as he swore to your fathers and gives you the land which he promised to give to your fathers, and if you keep all these commandments and do them which I command you today to love the Lord your God and to walk in always in his ways, then you shall add three more cities for yourself besides these three, lest innocent blood be shed in the midst of your land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, and thus guilt of bloodshed be 
upon you. Oh, okay. So in other words, Moses is sort of taking it now to the next level. He's addressing the matter of adding three additional cities if in their obedience, walking always in God's ways, God enlarged their territory and gave them more land. Now, here again, we address this issue of being disproportionate because it indicates that they were to ensure three more cities were added proportionate to the amount of land that was added to their territory. Do you get the, uh, the impression that not only does God take these cities of refuge very seriously, but he wants them very accessible, always available. He wants to make every provision to ensure that if anyone needs to flee, there's a city of refuge to flee to. And it's available for all. A day's travel away, the roads are wide, well-maintained, unfettered access to these cities of refuge. That's going to make more sense here shortly. Verse 11, but if anyone hates his neighbor, lies in wait for him, rises against him, and strikes him mortally so that he dies, and he flees to one of these cities, then the elders of his city shall send and bring him from there and deliver him over to the hand of the avenger of blood that he may die. Wow. You sh your eye shall not pity him, but you shall put away the guilt of innocent blood from Israel. Watch this, that it may go well with you. Oh. Okay, let me see if I got this straight. Okay, we got a guy who really murders Harry. I mean, this was not an accident. That axe head did not fly off the handle. He took that axe, and he's a, the quintessential, the first axe murderer. <laughs> that's, that's pretty graphic, but I think you get the point, right? He's truly a murderer. This was a premeditated first degree murder. He lied in wait. He was waiting for the opportune time to strike because of his hatred and anger. He murdered this man. So after he murders him, he figures, hey, I can tell the same story when I get back, you know, to the city and I can tell him, hey, it was an accident. Man, I should have tightened my axe head and sure enough, it flew off like you know what happened the, the other time with the other guy and it killed the guy and I'm so psyched it was a freak accident and no it wasn't you murdered him and yet this guy flees to the city of refuge acting all innocent yeah can you believe it it happened twice the axe head flew off the handle well the Israelites are to deal with him not feel sorry for him, show any pity to him. And I find it interesting that God would say, if you want it to go well with you, you better deal with this and put away the guilt of innocent blood from Israel. Otherwise, I can't bless you. Forget about enlarging your territories. This is really serious stuff. Now, First, there's something here that we need to know because it's so important, it's vital to our understanding. In fact, I'll take it to the other side of the table. To misunderstand this will be akin to seeing God as being harsh, unloving, and unjust. I mean, if you think about it, just looking at it, sort of from the sidelines, doesn't that seem a little bit harsh? I mean, a poor guy, he's just, you know, he's claiming to be innocent when he's not, and so you're saying that we need to kill him because he is? I mean, give him a chance, give him a trial, give him something, you know, 
a Coke, I don't know, a Musabi, I don't know, give him something. Give him a break. No. <laughs> you have to understand that there's a biblical distinction between killing someone and murdering someone. See, to murder is to kill, but to kill is not necessarily to murder. Okay, what about the commandment, the sixth commandment, Exodus 20, 13, thou shalt not kill. Wrong translation. It should not be thou shalt not kill. It should be thou shalt not murder. Big difference. In war, when we kill, that's not murder. Self-defense, I kill, that's not murder. Big difference. An accidental death, that's not murder. I'm in an automobile accident and God forbid someone dies. That's not murder. There's a big difference. And if you don't understand that difference, then this judgment, this putting away the innocence of the blood of the Israelites uh, will seem to be unjust and unharsh and harsh. By the way, this is what give, gives God such bad press, does it not? I mean, how many times whenever you share with somebody about the Word of God, and especially the Old Testament, what is their response, especially when they find out that on a Thursday night when you could be home watching TV, isn't American Idol on Thursday nights? I don't even know what's on TV. I know. Anyway, you could be watching something on TV. My goodness. And then, you know, someone calls you up and says, hey, you want to go chop wood? <laughs> no, thank you, no. <laughs> Say, hey, what are you doing tonight? <laughs> no, I forgot the wood part. Uh, what are you going to do tonight? Oh, I'm going to go to church. You're going to go to church. It's Thursday night. What's the matter with you? Well, listen, we're in the book of Deuteronomy. Huh? Yeah, it's in the Old Testament. The Old Testament? Isn't that the Old Testament? That's old. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to go to, to church on a Thursday night and study the Old Testament. Think about that. I mean, I completely forgot what my point was, but I know it was deeply <laughs> profound. It'll come to me uh, probably closer to 10 o'clock tonight. I'll just email you and let you know what the profound point was. I was so good, too. I was really... What was that? Bad press. Thank you. <laughs> Here's the thing. God gets this bad press because he's seen as this harsh God. He's not a harsh God. Yeah, but in the Old Testament, he's a God of wrath. He's going to put to death someone who's claiming to be innocent when they're not. Isn't that harsh? How can a God of love do that. If he was loving, he wouldn't do that. He wouldn't command the Israelites to do that if he was a God of love. Oh, listen. If he was not a God of love, he wouldn't do that. Well, yes, but God is supposed to be love. Well, God is love, but God is just. Here, here's an illustration. Actually, there are a couple of things here. I want to share with you, one of which is, years ago, truly this was on the mainland, um, it was a, a good friend of mine, actually a, 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 a classmate of mine from kindergarten uh, all the way to graduating from high school, uh, his wife was at a memorial service that just so happened to be at, uh, not the church I pastored, but my uh, home church. And I was, you know, it was a big memorial service, and and the deceased was murdered. And it was a big deal. And, you know, so this discussion came up about the justice of God. And she didn't understand the difference between killing and murdering. And she was having considerable difficulty wrapping her mind around everything that had happened in this first degree murder case. And I think that oftentimes we, 
we misunderstand the goodness of God, the grace of God, the love of God, because we equate God's love with being tolerant. And oh boy, is that not the clarion call today. We Christians are so intolerant, so unloving, so full of hate. And I think to myself, you know, they're in the last days going to increasingly call what is evil good and what is good evil. And so here we are serving God who is only always good, and we're seeing as the ones who hate, the ones who are intolerant, the ones who pass harsh judgment. Surely a God of love would not do this, and he would accept everyone because he loves everyone. He does love everyone. But here's a, a second thought I wanted to share with you. Can you imagine if you're in a courtroom and on trial is a pedophile? And when it comes time, the verdict is in, and the sentencing phase by the judge is, you know, I'm just going to let this one slide. And I'm just going to let you off for time served. And I'm not going to, you know, pronounce judgment and sentence you to death. This is really the fuel in the tank against the death penalty. And we live in a day where you can literally get away with murder because of it. Now let me ask you a question. How just is that judge? Oh, but he's being loving and he's accepting and he's tolerating and he's, no, he's not. He is unloving because what about the victims? What about the victims upon whom that crime was perpetrated? How, this is not love, and it's not justice. It's neither. Conversely, when God pronounces this judgment and commands the Israelites to do this, he is being both just and loving. You cannot separate the two. So this is why Moses talks about the one who is truly guilty and is found guilty by virtue of his anger and hatred. We see it in the details of the example, the illustration that he gives in the account. This man used a weapon, lied in wait, and that shows forensically premeditation. In this case, the murderer, because that's what he was, was to be brought out of the city of refuge and he was to be put to death, the death penalty. Not harsh at all. Let me round the corner. <laughs> Some of you are saying, please, will you? Okay. This all paints a beautiful picture on the canvas of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. As even the whole of the Old Testament does. Everything points to the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is our city of refuge. He is our high priest. We saw the role of the high priest as it relates to the cities of refuge in Numbers chapter 35. Just like the cities of refuge, Jesus is who we flee to. And when we do, we're both safe and saved by his life, and as we saw in Numbers 35, freed by his death. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This speaks to speaks of, points to, the person of Jesus Christ, whom we flee to. I'll go quickly through these. Here are the comparisons, the similarities, the 
parallels between Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus Christ, the finished work on the cross, and what these cities of refuge would represent. First, the cities of refuge were a place where one could be saved from death. Just as we, when we flee to Jesus Christ, our city of refuge, we are saved from eternal death. They were provided divinely by God himself. It was his hand who provided these cities of refuge. It was a place of refuge for all who would come. All who call, who come to Jesus Christ will be saved. It was for any and all who would come, Jew and Gentile alike. This was not Jews only. There was no sign on any of those cities of refuge that said, no Gentiles allowed. <laughs> this is a problem. I'm an Arab. I'm a Gentile. I can't flee to this city of refuge. No. In Christ, there is neither Jew, nor Greek, nor Arab, nor Hawaiian, nor Japanese, nor Chinese, nor you fill in the blank. It is available to all alike. And boy, aren't we seeing that in the book of Romans? with the Apostle Paul sort of rebuking in a sanctified way the Jews who had this superiority, thinking themselves, fancying themselves as being better than the Gentiles. The fourth one, everyone had access, unfettered access to these cities of refuge. Listen, there is nothing that is on the road blocking the way to the one who said, I am the way. The road is well maintained, the signs are well marked, and anyone who wants to go can go. When one fled to the city of refuge, they were safe and secure. I think this speaks to the security that we have in our salvation in Jesus Christ. This is an issue amongst some in Christendom today that would argue, well, just because you're once saved doesn't mean you can always be saved. I mean, you can, in other words, you're going to lose your salvation. And by the way, these are the same churches, again, not here, on the mainland. You have to get saved every week just to be sure, just to be secure. You know, I kind of blew it last week. I better come forward again. And boy, you got to think about the pastor giving altar calls. They're very successful. Everybody, <laughs> the whole church, yes, I, forgive me, Father, I am a sinner. And because they're insecure. Now, we talked about this on Sunday. How that if I live my life based on my works, I will never have the assurance. I will never be secure. I will always be unstable and unsure and uncertain if my works were good enough. This was and represented a place of security. You and I are secure in Christ, our greater than the city of refuge. Never allow the enemy who is a thief and a liar, the father of lies, to rob you of that, to get you to question that. This is why, by the way, the Apostle Paul would so eloquently say, put on the helmet of salvation. What does the helmet protect? The mind. You're putting on the helmet of salvation that protects your mind from those seeds of doubt that Satan tries to plant. I don't know, JD. That's. Uh, <clears throat> are you sure? I don't know. And then you start doubting. That's why we're to take every thought captive into the obedience of Christ. The battlegrounds in the mind. Now Satan can't read your mind, but he can sure plant. Thoughts in your mind. He does it all the time. When we get into trouble is when we invite him in and let him stay. He comes knocking on the door of our mind. Hey! And he never, he always comes as an angel of light. You'll never have Satan knock on your door and you look through the people. <laughs> of course, he's wearing red tights and he's got a pitchfork. I mean, that's what he looks like, right? That's what we're told. And he'll never say to you, Hi! <laughs> I am Satan, and I'm here to destroy your life, to get you to question your salvation, 
to plant seeds of doubt about your security in Jesus Christ. Oh, cool, come on in. Can I get you anything? Make yourself at home. And we let him stay and we entertain him and we feed him and no wonder. And when I got the helmet of salvation on and that knock comes on the door, he ain't coming in. He tries to plant the doubt. Well, you know, I don't know. And then you just say, well, that's, <laughs> you can do whatever you want. I, I have my own sanctified way of doing it. I, let's just say pastorally it's something like buzz off. Okay, I'll let you uh, take it from there and you can fill in the blanks. But be gone. Remove yourself from my presence. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You're not going to get away with that. As for me and my house, we serve the Lord. I am saved. And Romans 8 promises me that nothing will separate me from the love that God has for me. Neither height, nor depth, nor red forked, white, tight wearing, you know, pitchfork carrying, you know, little cartoon characters. Nothing. No principality. Nothing is going to separate me from the love that God has for me. I am secure. You know, sometimes we'll go out and I'll be with my wife, which I, I'm never happier than I'm with the wife of my youth. And so every once in a while she'll say, hey, honey, will you carry my purse? <laughs> no, this, hey, listen, this is, and my response is, well, of course, darling, I will carry your purse. And it's interesting, whenever I do, I, I'm carrying a purse and invariably somebody's looking at me going, you know, <laughs> look at you. He's carrying his wife's purse. Psst. Listen. I wear the pants in my family. Okay, fine, dude, but your wife tells you which pair. <laughs> I'm just saying. Listen, I'm the head of my home. Yeah, but your wife is the neck, and she's going to tell you which way to turn, bruh. <laughs> but I always say to her, honey, I'd love to carry your purse because I am a secure man, and I am. And nobody's going to make me feel any different or insecure by the way they look at me or something they say to me like, <laughs> you're carrying your wise purse? Listen, if you actually, you know, loved your wife, you'd carry your purse too. So, buzz off. That's where you can say that in there. <laughs> but you get the point? There's a security. There's a safety there. And... All six cities of refuge were made known to all. You could not be anywhere close in proximity to the promised land, either on the east or the west side of the Jordan, and not know about these cities of refuge. So too, is that true with Jesus Christ? It's to know him and to make him known. And the one who fled was only kept safe in the city by the life of the high priest. We don't have that here in Deuteronomy. We have it in Numbers 35. As long as the high priest was alive, the one who fled was safe. It gets better. Freedom only came vis-a-vis -vis the death of the high priest. Again, a detail given to us in Numbers 35. What does that speak of? Our high priest our greater than the city of refuge. His death, his payment in full frees us from all our sin. And the cities of refuge were for one who was, now don't miss this, pronounced innocent. This is where it gets really interesting. I'll defer to Spurgeon. He says, God provided no sanctuary for real guilt Murder was not winked at, else had the land become both polluted and unsafe. Mercy to murderers would be cruel to the innocent. It was accidental or unpremeditated killing which here found shelter. The spiritual fact, however, watch this, far excels the type which the cities of refuge are, a type of Jesus Christ. He says, for in Jesus, the real sinner finds pardon and safety. Think about this. We're all not just guilty of 
you know, accidental death, involuntary homicide, if you want to say it that way, we're actually all guilty of first-degree murder. And there is a pronouncement of innocence, how? By the death of the high priest, Jesus Christ. So therefore, I am now pronounced not guilty, regardless of my sin. Let me say it again, and maybe I need to expound on it more for someone here tonight. Maybe Satan has been hunting you with an axe. <laughs> no, not with an axe. But he's been hunting you and haunting you and pursuing you. He seeks to devour you. He's condemning you. And you're letting him. Unnecessarily so. When all you have to do is flee to Jesus Christ, your city of refuge, where you will be safe and saved and freed from death, from the avenger of death because of the high priest's death and his subsequent resurrection, defeating death. Do you see how it works? Do you see the picture that's painted? That's what this is all about. Can, maybe I can say it this way. You no longer have to be on the run. You simply have to run to him. He is your refuge in times of trouble. You're in trouble. You've sinned. You've fallen short. You've murdered someone in your heart by your anger for them in your heart. By the way, that's coming up here in a second as we finish up the chapter. That's sin. The avenger of death, the enemy of your soul will pursue you, seeking to devour you. Run! <laughs> Run! Run to him. You'll be safe and you'll be saved. Verse 14. You shall not remove your neighbor's landmark, which the men of old have set, in your inheritance, which you will inherit in the land that the Lord your God is giving you to possess. Now, this is interesting for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that it sets in place a very important principle related to removing boundaries. Now, this has application and it has ramification both physically and spiritually in how it speaks first to the right to ownership of personal property. You might remember a prophecy update here a while back. I don't remember how many weeks ago it was, but we connected the dots of what's happening even now in the world to the Marxist agenda. By the way, I uh, recommended this on Sunday. Um, if you want to watch a DVD that will absolutely cause you a lot of stress, like you need more stress in your life, right? <laughs> and distress, I recommend a DVD documentary called Agenda. It's subtitled The Grinding Down of America. It will blow your mind. I don't recommend it for the faint of heart. It is absolutely the most sobering and eye-opening documentary you will ever watch in your life. And by the way, it will explain for you what we see happening now in the United States of America today. It kind of gives you the why behind the what of what we see happening in Washington, D.C. Well, that's another topic for another time, but be that as it may, not only were these boundaries not to be removed, but they were not to be moved because the men of old had set them in place. Now, <laughs> again, this has application both spiritually and even personally. I would suggest that the geopolitical move towards globalism and socialism, words you'd never hear in the context of the greatest and most powerful nation on planet Earth. But I would suggest to you that it's very plausible that we could see the seizing of personal property soon become a reality. 
And this is what Moses is speaking to, the right to have and own and possess personal property. Don't move those, don't mess with those boundaries that were set by the men of old. How about in the arena of the church? I mean, it doesn't really take a rocket scientist to figure out that they're removing, not just moving, removing the boundaries. And even moving the boundaries that the men of old had set. Let me give you an example. Um, there is this, and we're going to talk about this in our prophecy update on Sunday, but there's this uniting, this uh, ecumenical movement where the world's religions are now all coming together under one umbrella. We're all going to have a big group hug. Oh, we're not. We're going to be out of here by then. But the final dictator, the Antichrist, will rule a one-world religion. Even now, Pope Benedict, in the uh, same vein as his predecessor, Pope John Paul II, is planning to meet with all of the world's religions, Buddhism, Hinduism, all of the above, et al., coming together and praying as if to the same God, all uniting as one religion. Now, in order to do that, you've got to move some b doctrinal boundaries. <laughs> and in some cases, you're going to have to remove them altogether. Because if I'm going to walk like Amos 3.3 3 says, in agreement with someone, how can I do that? Unless I remove that doctrine. I mean, I, I, I surely cannot bring with me that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I've got to remove the. Replace it with A. And if I replace it with A, then what happens? Well, then I can join hands with Islam. And thus, if you didn't know this already, we have right now, even today, Chrislam. What? What's Chrislam? Christianity and Islam together. We'll talk about this more on Sunday. I know I just ruined your week, but it's happening. <laughs> 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. That's what Moses is addressing here. Verse 15. One witness shall not rise against a man concerning any iniquity or any sin that he commits. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter shall be established. If a false witness rises against any man to testify against him of wrongdoing, then both men in the controversy shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who serve in those days. And the judges, verse 18, shall make careful inquiry and indeed if the witness is a false witness who has testified falsely against his brother. I know that's a terrible place to end it and we already studied this so I won't go into great detail about it but we do have a most crucial principle woven into the fabric of these verses and one for which we would do well to take note of because of its application to us personally. God is once again establishing the testimony of two or more witnesses because one witness was insufficient judging a man guilty of murder. It not only speaks to the physical act of murder, but the spiritual act of assassinating someone's character by accusing them or slandering them. That's murder. If you're angry in your heart towards your brother, that's murder. You're murdering them. If you hate them in your heart, you're murdering them. One commentator said it best when they wrote that God is concerned about the murder of reputation as well as physical murder and commands, do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses, 1 Timothy 5.19. The same standard as proving murder. In other words, God 
allows this gossip, slander, false accusations, the assassination of a reputation, he allows it to rise to the level of the physical act of murder. He goes on to say, remember 1 Timothy 5.19 does not say except from two or three gossips. It says except from two or three witnesses. If a matter is false, it does not become true because many people hear it or many people repeat it. Boy, is that not true or what? You know those advertising campaigns? I, listen, if I wasn't called to the ministry, I think I would have gotten into advertising. The, the psychology of advertising is so intriguing to me. You know those, those advertising campaigns that will say something like, 50,000 people can't be wrong. <laughs> yes, they can. In fact, if 50,000 people are all in agreement, it's probably wrong because why it is the gate that leads to destruction. And many go, all 50,000 of them. See, you cannot base it on sheer numbers. Well, I, I saw it on the internet. I watched it on YouTube. It was posted on Facebook. Oh, pfft, must be true then. <laughs> what? Be careful, especially in this day. Let's bring it in for a close. Verse 19, then you shall do to him as he thought to have done to his brother, so this is a great deterrent, by the way. What a great way to end the chapter. So you shall put away the evil from among you, and those who remain shall hear and fear. I like that. And hereafter they shall not again commit such evil among you. Your eye shall not pity. Life shall be for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. <laughs> wow, really? <laughs> I always joke with my kids. I, they know I'm joking. At, at first they didn't, but I always say, in the Middle East, if you do this, they will cut off your hand, your foot, <laughs> your tongue. Anyway, it's a great parenting technique. you got to try it sometime. But Moses is addressing what to do in the event of a false accusation by telling them, to do to the accuser what would have been done to the accused. <laughs> oh, well, that kind of changes it a little bit. In other words, if someone falsely accused a man of murder, which carried the death penalty, he received the death penalty as if he committed the murder. <laughs> you might say that you're going to think twice before falsely accusing someone of any crime. Because whatever you accuse them of, if it's found to be a false accusation and you're slandering them, whatever would have been the penalty for them now becomes the penalty for you. Remember Haman, the book of Esther, tried to get the king to, and he issued the edict to have all of the Jews killed and he prepared the gallows to hang Mordechai. And in the end, because it was false, he himself was hanged in the very way on the very gallows that he had prepared in his false accusation. Now, one last thing here and we're done. It's interesting that, and I think we misunderstand this eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, hand for a hand, foot for a foot. We misunderstand this whole thing. See, God knows us so well. He knows us more than we even know ourselves. See, if someone takes my eye, it's not an eye for an eye. I want both eyes. Listen, you hit me and punch me and knock out my tooth, I want all your teeth. You uh, break my arm. I'm breaking both your arms and your legs. We know where you live. Right? That's human nature. We don't want to just get even. We want to one-up them in our revenge against them. And that's what Moses is talking about here. He's saying, no. 
Be careful when you accuse another. And when it comes time to the payment, do not seek to do more than what's been done to you. Now we have the parallel in the New Testament, and it's not an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth. We treat people the way we ourselves want to be treated. Now I try to use that in my parenting technique, and it doesn't work always because you know we, uh, as especially in sibling rival rivalry, and we see it in the church. You know, we're siblings in Christ, right? We're brothers and sisters in Christ. And sometimes there's that sibling rivalry in the body of Christ as brothers and sisters in Christ. And we seek to one-up the other, and we completely toss out the window the idea of do unto others as you would want them to do unto you. See, siblings will say, well, I'm just doing to him what he did to me. That's not what Jesus said. I'm, I'm doing unto him that which he has already done to me. No, 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 no. Do unto him that which you want him to do for you. Well, that never works. Yes, it does. But when you take matters into your own hands and seek out your own revenge and mete out your own justice, you take it out of the hands of God and you thwart the grace of God in the life of of that individual and the work of God to work it out with that individual. See, God will never force himself into a situation where we have already insisted that we take care of it. I'll take care of it. I'll take it from here, God. I'll, ta- I'll show him. God says, okay. After you've made a bloody mess of it, let me know and I'll come in and I'll try to do a healing work in the relationship. I think about Peter in the flesh taking his carnal weaponry his sword, and cutting off the ear of Malchus. And Jesus says, Peter, and he heals the ear. Bloody mess all over the place because of the flesh, using carnal weaponry. And Jesus says, this is a spiritual battle. This is a spirit, and you're not going to fight it with carnal weaponry. Our weaponry is not carnal in nature. Why don't you all stand? Thank you for your patience, by the way. I know I went a little bit long tonight. Father in heaven, thank you for your word and for this chapter here in Deuteronomy. It's, it's so packed, so full. And Lord, I pray that now as we close and even leave here tonight, that it won't be the end, but the beginning of the Holy Spirit being given permission to take that which we've seen here and read here and heard here tonight and do a much needed work in our hearts. Lord, for anyone here tonight that has been living under the condemnation of the enemy, I pray that they would flee to you as their city of refuge. And Lord, I I would pray also that this order that we have here, the seriousness with which you take matters such as these. Lord, I pray that we would take them as seriously as well, especially as it relates to following through and following up, having the integrity to do that which you've commanded us to do all that you've commanded us to do.